Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on the Asian giant hornet. My name is Todd Silver. I'm with the Office of Communication with the USDA's Agricultural Research Service. We're first going to present a short video on the dissection of the Asian giant hornet, followed by a live Q&A session with the experts. First, let's play the video. Hello, welcome to a dissection of the Asian giant hornet. I am Marina Mann, and I am super excited to show you what the inside of this giant wasp looks like and how scientists can collect individual organs in order to ask specific questions about the biology of this invasive insect, including what venom toxins are present and what microbes are infecting the insect. The goal is to study aspects of the wasp's biology to help eliminate the giant hornet from the USA. The following images are of insects being cut apart and thoroughly dissected. If you prefer not to see these images, this video will end in five minutes. I talk about lots of interesting facts, so consider covering your screen but listening to the audio. Thanks to our collaborators, I have the great honor of being able to dissect six specimens of the Asian giant hornet, which were collected from the nest found in northwestern Washington state in October of 2020. When biological samples are collected, there is key information that must be collected along with it for that sample to be useful in the future. Key data collected for these giant hornet samples includes location, date, who collected the samples, thanks Chris, the method of collection, and any other distinguishing information. These data are printed out for every single sample. It can become quite a lot if hundreds of insects are collected. I received two vials with three giant hornets inside each. These samples were collected in the field but have been stored in the freezer since, preserving them well. As a scientist, one of my favorite activities is using a microscope like the one shown here. I use this for my giant hornet dissections. This wasp is so large I barely needed a microscope, but magnification helps for teasing apart delicate internal organs and getting good images. Once I got the wasps situated under the dissecting scope, the first thing I did was inspect the sample. I noted that it has all the necessary body parts that make insects distinctive from other arthropods, including the head, thorax, and abdomen. Note the pinched waist is a characteristic that distinguishes wasps from bees. While looking at the face, I can't help but be amazed at how intimidating it is. There are five eyes. Two are highly specialized compound eyes that can see color and detail, while the three on top are simple eyes that keep track of shadows such as potential predators up above. All wasps, bees, and ants have five eyes like these. The very first thing I do with each sample is remove the head and cut it in half and collect the lower face, freezing it again to preserve it. This lower face sample contains the strong jaws of the hornet as well as any fungi, bacteria, or viruses associated with both the hornet itself and its last meal. Next up, I remove any legs that did not already fall off the thorax, and I cut off the wings. I saved each of these body parts as separate samples, just in case they are needed. Removing these parts also makes dissecting out the internal organs much easier. Then, I separated the thorax from the abdomen. The thorax of any flying insect is mostly composed of muscles that drive the wings and legs. Because the giant hornet is so big, these muscles can be dissected out quite easily. Moving on to the abdomen dissection. This body part contains most of the organs that we are interested in studying specifically the venom gland where the toxin for the painful sting is stored, and the gut for the wasp to digest its prey. But getting into the abdomen can be difficult. I found it rather slippery for tweezers. I chose to cut up both sides of the abdomen, then across the bottom so that I can open it like a book, exposing the organs inside. The organs are tied together by a network of white tubes, which are the insect's lungs. I extracted the ball of organs from the abdomen, then stretched it out and cleaned off some of the lung material to expose the gut itself. Because Asian giant hornets are social, only the queen produces eggs. 
I am dissecting workers, so their internal anatomy is relatively straightforward. Once I stretch out the gut, the venom gland is clearly visible. Next to the gut is a large, almost white, hard ball. It is about the size of a sesame seed. That is a lot of venom. After removing the venom gland, I clean up the gut a little more and then divide it into three pieces. Just like humans, different parts of the wasp, gut have different jobs when it comes to digesting food. These three sections are then carried off into separate sample tubes, and that concludes a dissection of the Asian giant hornet. You too can be involved in this effort to control the Asian giant hornet, and we need your help. Tracking the spread of the hornet in the U.S. depends on the public being vigilant. If you think you have found one, take a picture, record as much information as you can, and submit the sample to the Washington State Department of Agriculture for ID. Thank you. That was very interesting indeed. So before we actually get to the Q&A, we have some breaking news. And I'd like to throw it to Chris Looney, who's with the Washington State Department of Agriculture and is an Asian giant hornet expert. Uh, Chris, can you hear me? I can. Hi. So what'd you find, Chris? Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, today we found the second nest in the United States. Just uh, just about a half an hour ago, we were able to radio tag a hornet, a hornet that was reported by the public. Um, and we spent the last couple of days sort of following it around, watching it forage, ever getting ever closer to the nest. And um, one of our collaborators, a USDA FS personnel and some Oregon Department of Agriculture personnel who are up learning how to do these techniques uh, happened to be the the two people that found it while, while I was stumbling towards, towards them through the woods. So uh, a triumph. Timing is perfect. Thanks, Chris, for that breaking news. That's great. Um, so we're going to, and Chris is going to be putting out, uh, WSDS will be putting out more information in a press release soon uh, that describes the finding. So at this point, we're going to jump into the Q&A. And so let me give you a little instruction. Um, what we're going to do for the Q&A is submit your questions in the Q&A button, not in the chat. Uh, we're only going to be reading questions from the Q&A. So you should see at the bottom of your Zoom uh, nav bar a Q&A section, and that's where you can submit your questions. Uh, for questions we don't get to today, we're going to still answer them, and then we'll put it on the ARS, uh, USDA ARS AGH website, which is where you found the link to this. So we have four panelists today to answer your questions. Uh, Anne Lebrun is an Asian Giant Hornet Response and Research Projects Coordinator at USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Anna Childers is the project lead for USDA's Agricultural Research Services Ag 100 Test Initiative. Chris Looney is a bee expert, an Asian Giant Hornet bee expert with the Washington State Department of Agriculture, who you just heard. And uh, Marina Mann is an entomologist at Kenora University, and she's the one who actually did the Asian giant hornet dissection. So my first question to the panel is, what are you doing about these tests? Who would like to start? Well, uh, I'll, I'll take a first step since I'm standing here doing what we're doing about these pests as we speak. Um, like any kind of new introduced species where we think it might be a problem and we have an opportunity to eradicate it. We are spending a lot of time trying to detect them on the landscape, find out where they are and remove them. And the goal of that is to keep this population from being established and turning into either an ecological or agricultural or both pest. That's WSDA's role. And then just to add to that, um, USDA is also supporting this with um, our federal uh, funds and also technical expertise. We have our colleagues at Agriculture Research Service um, working on a bunch of projects to help support the response, to help us understand the genetic diversity, as well as um, some operational assistance with uh, attractants and lower development. And so APHIS is coordinating all of this um, as our role with in invasive species. Okay, let me, uh, Anna, did you wanna chime in? Go ahead, I think Anne captured it well. Okay, uh, so the next question is, are Asian giant hornets a threat to human health? 
or to humans? I'll answer that. The answer is sure. Um, like any stinging hymenoptera, they can deliver a painful injection of venom. The venom you just saw in that sesame gland, uh, sesame sized gland. Um, they are risky, particularly for people who might suffer anaphylactic shock, just like any yellow jacket or bee could be. Um, and because of their large size, if you are unfortunate enough to stumble into a nest and get stung many times, it can have kind of more severe uh, repercussions than if you were to say stumble into a paper wasp nest. That said, they are not really aggressive. They do not target humans. We've been messing around with them all week. And, and for the most part, they could care less that we are here. It's really if you are unlucky enough or um, <laughs> to be in the position of, of disturbing a nest that, that they're a risk to humans. Thank you. And are males as large as females? Um, they are slightly, it depends. So almost all the wasps you see are in fact females, um, just like honeybees, there's a, a single breeding specimen, that's the queen, uh, and then she has all these daughters, um, and those are the workers. The queen is much larger than the workers. The males are about as large as some of the bigger workers, but they're not as large as the queen. I can't imagine that one is bigger than the ones I've seen. Uh, so it would be kind of scary to see a queen, I'm sure. Uh, what are you planning on doing with the Asian giant hornets that have been collected and shipped? I could take that. So um, there's been several samples that Chris has actually been able to provide us. Um, We've had a, a certain number of the samples that he collected live last year were actually able to go to one of our USDA labs in Washington state where they're working on lure development. Um, and so it was important to have them alive for those tests and procedures. Uh, another set of samples uh, went to uh, Marina and uh, Michelle Hex lab. And so they are working on um, several things. I'll, I'll let them discuss in more detail, but certainly the, the venom work that, that she discussed as well as um, investigating microbes, um, uh, including um, the bacteria, the fungi, and the viruses that are in these Asian giant hornets. Another sample went to another of our um, labs that's out in Hawaii, uh, where we did some extractions to sequence the genome. So now we have um, uh, have a reference a genomic sequence uh, for the nests that uh, we actually had already gotten a sample from the nest that was found in, uh, in British Columbia in, uh, on Vancouver Island. Um, and so we had sequenced the genome of that specimen and we got one from Nest Zero last year and we've sequenced the genome of that to, to uh, provide the basis for a lot of other work, um, which we can discuss further. But uh, if, if Marina wants to discuss uh, the work that she's specifically doing and, and highlighted in this video. Hi, yeah, uh, thank you guys for all being for being here. Um, as a PhD student in Dr. Michelle Heck's uh, molecular biology lab, and Michelle is part of the ARS, I am in the unique position to be able to collaborate with both with the ARS, APHIS, and Washington State Department of Agriculture. Um, and so the six wasps that I gained access to uh, are going to be used to study the proteins from the venom gland. Uh, venom glands are historically been studied, they've been studied historically uh, because they're full of toxins that the wasps use to, um, to collect their own prey. And so we could potentially use these proteins from the venom against the wasp as a insecticide. And then additionally, uh, the gut is a great source of microbes like bacteria, fungi, and viruses, just like in humans. And so studying the gut microbes can uh, tell us a lot more about how this wasp survives and maybe even where it came from. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this next question is probably gonna be for Chris. Uh, have nest removal methods been modified for the season? No, we're still planning to use the same approach, um, which is if, if you saw in the news last year, we essentially vacuum them up. Um, this seemed to be the safest approach, the least toxic approach, required the less sort of um, environmental considerations, and we know that it works really, really well based on what people do in its native range and what people do to collect living wasps here. It also does create the benefit of having uncontaminated samples that we can share with researchers um, and mess about with ourselves with, uh, without having to, to clean anything up. So 
really the only difference is this nest is is in fact in the ground more uh, which is more typical of, of this how this species nests last year it was in a hollow tree so we had to we had to basically climb the tree and vacuum them out of a hole there but uh, this year we'll just be on our hands and knees Next question is, uh, do these hornets suffer with, uh, I'm going to say this right, tracheal mites, tracheal mites? I think that's a great question. Um, and I think that the dissections like this and um, sampling like this is, is the way that we're going to answer that question. Uh, I'm not aware of whether they do in their native range. Um, I know that tracheal mites can be a problem in honeybees in the United States. Um, and so, like I said, through uh, through this sort of research is, is how we'll answer that question. I think along with that, if um, this sort of research and the dissection work will help us to find out if the Asian giant hornet is a vector for any other honeybee diseases or pests. Just to add the underlying uh, current in both Anne and Anna's comments is, is that there's a lot about this species we simply don't know because it's never been that important uh, of a research focus in its native range that changes once it shows up somewhere new. Do we have any ideas on the average colony size of these nests? Uh, yeah, that is mostly though based on a very limited set of studies that were conducted in Japan and it ranges from several hundred, uh, it's usually several hundred workers will be occupying a nest at a given time. Um, that's not as big in terms of numbers as some other kinds of yellow jackets or hornets, but what they what they lack in abundance, they make up for in girth. So they're big. Yeah, and we also know that the the workers tend to live for about two weeks, um, so that they're not a very long lived worker. And then in the nest, the combs are um, the cells are reused. So count even just counting the cells won't give you a clear understanding of how many hornets a nest produced um, or how many are alive and well at a given time. What's the likely scenario on how these hornets arrived in North America? So we don't know for sure what the answer to that is and um, we would love to know, but the truth is we, we may never know. Um, so we are doing what we can right now. And you know, each season we've gathered a lot of information and we've taken that and moved forward um, in our response. Yeah, and I'll say the genome sequencing um, work that we're doing is with the hopes of at least pinpointing the origin country of this, which may help uh, narrow down the possibilities of how they came here. But like Anne said, it's unlikely that we'll ever truly know exactly how they arrived. Then where was the second nest found? Um, in the woods in northern Whatcom County. And was it close to the first nest? A few miles. Two miles, okay. A few miles, uh, not, not too exactly. Oh, okay. Uh, will we find out if this nest is a daughter of the nest that was found last year? Um, possibly, and I think that's a really great question for Anna to answer. Yeah, so like I said, we've now generated um, high quality genome assemblies from um, a nest from both the can Canadian find as well as nest zero from here. And so the, we'll do a slightly different type of sequencing on a lot of additional, any additional specimens that are found in the United States. We're also doing sequencing, similar types of sequencing on hornets that are found across Asia. And so by comparing and aligning those um, assemblies, we'll be able to determine how related any two hornets are to each other versus um, hornets that might be from a, a different find. And that'll help us answer um, whether these are from the same introduction or from different introductions. All right. I think the, the Q and A's are testing me now. So looking at similarities and differences from a honeybee dissection, do these hornets have a part of their digestive tract that is analogous to the crop and proventriculus? You can tell I'm not a scientist. I think I can take that one. <laughs> um, 
So I will say my expertise in bees is a little bit less than my PhD studies topic. However, um, I, the Asian giant hornets do have a crop and because they have a crop, they probably have a proventriculus as well. Um, thank you. Much better than I can tell. Uh, this is a question for Chris. What's the status of the hive found and treated in 2020? And were efforts to eradicate that hive successful? Um, they were, that's, that's how we ended up with it. Um, and the status of the nest, it was, um, it is currently being displayed at the county fair here in, in Linden. And after that, it will be uh, donated to the Smithsonian National History Museum. Chris, can you comment? I think what that question might be asking is in terms of the, the reproductives that um, were found in the nest there at the end. Um, the, the additional queens that you found in the nest. Uh, I, I think they're trying to ask what might have happened with those. Oh, okay, of course. Um, so I might, all right. So, so we found that nest, of course, what, two months later, I guess, than, than we found this one. Um, so it was much further in its colony cycle and it was at the point where it was producing the next generation of reproductives, the new queens that would leave. And in fact, when we opened the nest, there were about a hundred queens in there um, and many, many more cells waiting for queens to emerge. Um, we captured the lion's share, we believe, based on counting um, the cells that were obviously capped uh, just prior to, to removing the nest, but we can't, um, we can't uh, preclude the possibility that some queens escaped beforehand, and, and that could have been one of the queens that led to, to this nest here. So um, some probably got out, but thankfully not the majority. Interesting question. Is there a way to raise an Asian giant hornet in a lab? And is there a specific pathogen on the Asian giant hornet? Let's pick that one. Well, I can say that we don't know of anybody who has a colony of Asian giant hornets. Um, certainly that would be something that we would take advantage of if there was one that we could study. Um, but we don't know about that. Um, Let's see, Marina, do you want to maybe answer the second part of that about the pathogen? Yeah, I think the short answer is until we do our gut and venom gland and the anatomy analysis um, by sequencing, we really don't know. Do we know what viruses the, the, the Asian giant hornet has in common with honeybees? Again, that's that's something that we're hoping um, right now we're working to prepare those samples uh, for sequencing. And then um, we have a wealth of information about the viruses um, that honeybees carry um, uh, around the country as well as in other countries. And so we'll be able to compare those to determine if they're similar viruses or not. Okay. Next question is uh, early days, but do you have any ideas as to its climatic requirements, would you expect the range to be similar to Vespa volutina? I probably said the last one. Well, we know from the literature that the native range extends um, south into Southeast Asia and then from Japan over into um, like the border of India and then north up to like uh, the Russia China border. So the native range is quite far. Um, one of the questions that we're hoping to answer is if there are any subspecies that are maybe more focused in the, the tropical areas. Um, Anna, do you want to add to that at all? So yeah, we're, we're trying to source specimens from across this native range right now. And, and like I mentioned, doing some sequencing on those. Um, so there are different biology um, and behavioral traits that, that they display in different um, locations. So we would call those subpopulations. And so uh, those behaviors could affect um, how well they adapt to um, a new area. If they're more uh, cold adapted versus warm adapted, you know, how large their colonies get, maybe um, it's that, those sort of things. So it's known that they differ in their native range. And so if we perhaps had an introduction from a very Southern range to a Northern uh, climate like this, you know, you would think that they would not be as adapted perhaps. 
Um, so knowing where they came from is going to help us determine the likelihood of their spread and then the areas that they would uh, most find uh, hospitable to them here. What is the area covered and the density of traps that you're using to monitor this insect? Um, we're using at least one trap per square kilometer. And the area covered is, I don't remember the total square kilometers. Do you, Ann? <laughs> it's, uh, it's immense. It, it stretches from um, sort of the, the western border of Whatcom County up to about the, where the Cascades start and then south almost all the way to Bellingham. Uh, we're trying to cover as much ground as possible, particularly because the traps aren't uh, as specific as some other insects. So we have to make up for that by, um, by having more of them. And then we have a, an auxiliary grid in Snohomish County in the Marysville area. And I should say, those are just the traps that we're running as an agency. We have, again, probably a thousand more traps, or not a thousand, yeah, probably about a thousand traps out that are um, being, placed and staffed by, by private citizens and collaborating agencies, cities, things like that. So there's quite an effort. And uh, this kind of piggybacks on an early question. Uh, when you're collecting them, have you seen any parasites or mites on, on these hornets? Not so far. Okay. Um, can native birds eat them or another natural enemy? Or are they nearly immune to all potential predators, including bears? We all know the relationship um, with the bears and bees. There is no reason to think that a bird, given the right circumstances, might eat them. But there's no evidence that there are any vertebrates other than human beings that um, that prey on these habitually. So we're not gonna. We're probably not gonna be able to biocontrol our way out of this one. Yeah. Have there been any confirmed sightings uh, outside the Pacific Northwest? No. And how deep into the interior, this is how far east of the Pacific Ocean, have they been observed? Um, all of the all of the Whatcom County observations that we have are still within, I don't know, 10-ish miles of, of Blaine. Um, they're really not that far yet, which is one reason we feel like we have this, this window of opportunity to act. Okay. And uh, this comes from Isle Rainey's, four years old. She wants to know, uh, what do these hornets, what will they do to other bees? Hi, I can take this one. So these hornets are a big uh, threat in the eyes of the honeybee um, growers, <laughs> for lack, honey, the apiists, because uh, these giant hornets use other insects as prey for to feed their young. And so that includes hives of honeybees. And once they find a hive, once one worker finds a hive, it sends out a pheromone to attract the rest of the Asian hornet workers. And then they proceed to decapitate the honeybees and carry them back to the Asian giant hornet nest. So it's not a good ending for honeybees. Okay. Do these hornets have a preference for types of areas to nest? Have we found that? Yeah, that's pretty well documented in the literature. Um, maybe 80, they nest in cavities, hidden places. So they're not going to be the, the Winnie the Pooh nest you see up in a tree. They're not like Vespa bellatina, which somebody raised earlier. Um, they nest in protected places. More often than not, that is in or close to the ground. As we learned last year, and, and by rereading the literature, that can also be in tree cavities. And there are some really, really uncommon reports. I mean, six or seven out of thousands of, of nests in a low wall cavity or under a tarp or something like that. But for the most part, they're ground or near ground nesting animals in, in the wild. And they choose a pre-existing cavity. They don't excavate a cavity. So they're looking for something that's already open for them to build their nest in. Okay. And uh, other than the samples that, are, that were kept alive, are all the other ones found being eradicated? And then the second part is, uh, what is Canada doing on their side? Uh, yeah, it, every sample, every animal from last year is dead, just to be clear about that. And the ones that we do keep alive do not live very long. They, they serve their, 
their purpose. They give it up for science and then we kill them. Um, and Canada is doing very similar work to us. They're using the same kind of traps, uh, a lot of citizen outreach and um, you know resident outreach, like trying to rely on, on people's eyes and ears as well as their own trapping program. It's yeah, not much different. Next question is, if the lifespan is about two weeks, how long from egg to adult? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that was in any of the literature that I saw. Um, Anna or Marina, do you have any, any thoughts? I'm not, I'm not positive for the Asian giant hornets, but I know for honeybees, you're talking about, I think, 16 to 20 or so days, depending on the cast. Um, it's, it's from, from egg to, to an adult that emerges. So I would suspect it would be in that range, but I don't know positively for this species. And I did just remember that the estimate from about when a queen starts a nest to the emergence of the first workers is, is 30 ish days or slightly less. Um, so, you know, it's a vulnerable time in the colony. Sounds like it's really similar to what Anne just said, Anna just said about honeybees. Has there been any investigation on the response of these insects to chemical insecticides that are on the market in the US? So we, um, when we were preparing our environmental documentation for this response as the federal government, we have to consider um, you know, the impact to the environment. We are approved to use um, certain chemicals to treat the hornets. However, um, like Chris mentioned earlier, we found that vacuuming the uh, live hornets was very helpful, both for uh, personnel safety and also for the research. Um, so that is our preferred method. Okay. Are these hornets likely to po pose more of a problem than cicada killers? Because I understand there are new arrivals. Um. So cicada killers aren't really a problem, generally speaking. They they eat cicadas. That's in their name. So, um, so the answer is inherently yes, and that is because even if the hornets were only in their native range, they eat things that we care about. I cultivated honeybees, uh, and they sting us. Which cicada killers, you got to work really, really hard to make one of those do that to you. So. Um, so in that very narrow way of thinking about these animals' biology, yeah, they're more of a problem. Okay. And then what do these uh, Asian giant hornets eat besides honeybees? Um, uh, so they're, they're pretty broad-minded in, in what they eat. Basically, any insect that they can catch that is large enough to be worth their time, they will eat. Um, there's evidence in Japan that they feed a lot on chafer beetles and katydids. Um, they are maybe specialists on social hymenoptera in general, so not just honeybee species, but also yellow jackets, other Vespa species. You know, we don't have any in, in Western United States, but there are oh, several in, in their native range, um, paper wasps. And we actually were able to, through the kind donation of the, the nest that was tracked last year, um, use, again, molecular techniques, genetic sequencing to, to find out what was in the poop of the larvae. Um, and not to put too fine a point on it, and they fed uh, honeybees, um, five species of native yellow jacket, one introduced yellow jacket actually, so five species of yellow jacket, a couple of species of dragonfly, there was a moth, a butterfly, some beetles, some large flies that we think were probably prey rather than beetles that, or than flies that live in the nest, um, or it's some hamburger in there. So. Uh, they'll feed on lots of different things, they seem to prefer social hymenoptera, and I think the that there was a graphic that WSDA produced that is, if not posted on this, on the website associated with this, is certainly available on our own website. Yeah, and I'll just speak to the fact that while any insect sort of will meet their protein needs, you know, and, and their their desire for, for acquiring protein, the reason that they're really interested likely in social hymenoptera is because that provides a lot of food in one location, right? And so at, at the time of the year when the nest is really expanding and they start to produce reproductives, their protein needs really increase quickly. So by attacking a honeybee hive or something like that, there's a lot of protein to be gained um, with a relatively smaller effort rather than just flying through the forest trying to find um, an insect one by one. We have time for a few more questions. Uh, is there a theory about how the Asian giant hornet was detected near 
So no homesh, I'm definitely brutalizing these words, is related to the detections in blame. Okay, Chris. <laughs> um, so there is no molecular or morphological evidence that the Snohomish County find was related in any way to the specimens from Blaine. Um, and furthermore, that was a, a male that was found at a really strange time of the year when you would not find males coming out of a nest of any kind. Um, it was clearly dead for a while. It seems most likely that that was a stowaway that died in some kind of stuff and just through pure happenstance and the fact that we're all worked up about hornets right now somebody saw it i don't know if there's anything you want to add in no just that um you know we certainly appreciate the reports um because you never know um so it's certainly better to report it than to not so and we have put out a um grid or wsba is working on has a grid out there in the marysville area in Homish County to keep an eye out to see if there is an active population in the area. So far, um, we haven't had any detections in that area other than that one in June. In June. And Chris, uh, there's a question for you about uh, when does USDA plan on making the official announcement about the new nest? I, I think sometime today, probably, but I'm not entirely positive because that's uh, handled by somebody else. Okay, AGH would assumably, assumably compete with other hornets and wasps as well as predate other species. Some of these competitors and prey could include threatened, endangered, and endemic species. And the question is, have relevant taxa been identified and, and are they being monitored or tracked currently? From Washington's perspective, Lawrence, we're not quite there. Um, we're still dealing with a very small population that is in um, that is probably not in a position to impact anything other than the occasional hive kill. So, so no, we're not monitoring any threatened or endangered species. But going back to Anna's point about why they seem to specialize on social hymenoptera, that would be a, that would become a very short list um, of things we probably would monitor. We wouldn't expect, even if we had monarchs flying around, that they would dig into them. There's no evidence, at least in the literature, to, to that we should worry about that. And that is another reason that we started doing the, uh, the fecal analysis. And we hope to do a little bit more, both with nest we just found, some of the samples left over from last year is kind of expensive um, uh, to, to come up with a prey list. I mean, there was a lot of people have asked the question, do they feed on native bumblebees? Again, there's no records in the literature. There's also no reason why one might not encounter them. Um, phenologically, they don't seem to really match up in, in the same way, but um, that was the kind of question we were interested in asking. Do, do they feed on native bumblebees? So, so I think that's a question we can sort of, um, we can delay for the time being, focus on eradicating them. Okay. Do you have any known attractants such as semi uh, chemicals, perhaps sex pher pheromones, Maybe caramel, such as the alarm pheromone of the honey. Well, that's one of our questions. You know, we want to improve our operations on the ground with better traps and lures. Um, and so uh, the researchers over at Agriculture Research Service in the Wapato, Washington lab are helping with that, as are some of the APHIS researchers in our Massachusetts lab. Um, Anna, do you want to talk any more about that? Or Chris, I think uh, there's a bunch of new lures that Jackie has put together for you guys to try. That's exactly right. We will be um, deploying, we were supposed to deploy them earlier this week, but then I had to leave, so I wasn't able to pick them up and bring them. But next week, we'll be deploying lures that are based on the volatiles that emerge from uh, honeybee brood. Um, volatiles that are given off by bacillus that's based on some research on Vespa velatina in Korea and then and then the alarm pheromone itself um, if you think about how social hymenoptera respond to to an incursion by a giant vertebrate predator like like a human uh, they give off an alarm pheromone that attracts their sisters around so we'll try that as well um, and then some of these hornets that we collected today or that we will be collecting soon we'll go to those same labs to look for yet more sorts of uh, chemicals that might be relevant and you know better than orange juice yeah, certainly, as you can imagine, you know, the limited number of collections that we have had is it limits that research in and of itself to identify those potential chemicals, and then as well to test it. 
obviously we don't want to keep these hornets alive for any amount of time, but in a very controlled way, Jackie was able to be able to look at, at some of those things um, and do very precise um, isolations of those. Um, but testing it requires both the field aspect and, and hopefully potentially small amounts of lab work to see what their preferences are. Uh, for Robert in the UK, uh, the, the, the hornets in the nest have been found in Washington state. Um, do we know how far workers range from the nest? Um, yes, the literature suggests they can go up to five miles, but that's typically under relatively dire circumstances where there aren't good foraging opportunities nearby. Um, certainly for, it makes more sense that they forage closer and, and, and usually it's within a mile or less. And in fact, um, that's mostly what we've observed up here as well, to the extent that we can connect any foraging workers back to a given nest. Okay. And uh, can you discuss the trap placement strategy that, that's being used? Uh, what type of locations are they being placed? Um, and it's so excellent to hear the public's been helping out. Um, I guess I'll take that one as well. The, the strategy is um, driven primarily by access. <laughs> um, there's no, there's no, again, real evidence in the literature that there's a specific kind of place or tree or something like that that would be ideal for trapping the hornets. So most, and a lot of the work we, or a lot of the knowledge we have about traps are, is anecdotal uh, more than experimental. Um, so to that extent, we hang them in places that are along tree lines because animals, uh, flying insects do tend to hug tree lines to some degree. Um, we hang them in places where people are willing to let us hang a trap of orange juice and rice wine in a tree. Um, and, and honestly, right now, it's not a whole lot more refined by that. It's trap placements actually driven more by where we find specimens probably than what particular features of the landscape, um, we, we might be thinking about. Okay. Because of the size compared to honeybees, can entrance reducers protect the hive? So Chris, I think there was um, a beekeeper up in the Whatcom area that uh, reported having a reducer on and seeing uh, hornets attacking a hive. So yes, it's possible. I know that the, there is some concern uh, from beekeepers about the uh, use of reducers. Um, so if, it, if the entrance is small enough, then an Asian giant hornet wouldn't be able to get in and sort of kill out the whole whole hive. And any of you beekeepers that are interested in that question, there's there's uh, actually quite a lot of um, literature. And then I say that I don't mean like scientific literature necessarily, but there's a lot of knowledge that beekeepers in places where this species is native um, have acquired over the last oh, couple hundred years, I guess, 150 years, mostly focused around Western honeybee, uh, Apis mellifera. Um, you can look that up as everything from hive reducers to special baffle cages to kids with badminton rackets. There's, there's a lot of different techniques that beekeepers use to, to limit hive destruction. Okay, I have a great last question for you. Are these bees good for anything? Yeah, but maybe not here. <laughs> if you think okay. about it, in their native range, they are part of the ecosystems that people live in and love and recreate in and thrive in and produce in. Um, so you, describing them as good or bad for anything is really situational. Um, they are a pest to us. And when I say us, I mean humans in general, that people spend time managing. Um, we're worried that they'll become more than just a pest if they become introduced in North America. But sure, they're good for all kinds of cool things. They're really neat looking for one thing. They are. Yeah, they have five eyes, which I learned. Um, so uh, the last question I have for all of you um, is, uh, can you tell us what your agency is doing with you know, research or eradication, what you're doing with these giant hornets? And uh, I'll throw it first to Anne. Thanks. Um, so APHIS, uh, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, where I work, we are really coordinating everything. Um, we have WSDA who's out there in the field, as you can see Chris is right now. Um, and APHIS is 
providing technical and financial support, and then also coordinating with other parts of the federal government that might be able to help, like um, the Agriculture Research Service. Marina? Hi, yes, as I said earlier, um, I am in a lab run by an ARS scientist, Dr. Michelle Heck, and as a Cornell PhD student, uh, my role is to help analyze the proteins that we extract from the venom and also to help do the microbial analysis from the gut and the jaws in collaboration with ARS, APHIS, and WSDA. First, we probably have an idea what you're doing, but go ahead. I'm sorry, will you say that again? Oh, uh, <laughs> I was asking about uh, what WSDA is doing uh, with the Asian Giant Hornet domain, As aside from tracking and locating. Oh, we so, I mean, okay. That's it. But because of that, we're in sort of a unique position, though, then to provide fresh specimens to all the researchers that, um, you know, that you see on this panel and, and others that remain unnamed as right now. And, and then they are able to bring their special expertise to bear on all the little parts of, of understanding this animal's biology that would contribute to, to knowing how best to approach eradication. So um, one of the things we're going to try to do today, for instance, um, that I think only we can do because of where we are is, is get a game camera on that nest and see if we can observe it for a little while as we get all of our stuff together to eradicate. So maybe we'll learn some more about how often workers leave and, and how many are coming out of the nest, things like that. Um, just basic natural history that we don't even know much about. Okay. And Chris, would you like to comment on how long your efforts, um, you plan to continue your efforts at, up in Washington State? Yeah, and I think Anne will correct me if I get this wrong, but we will continue these efforts until one, it spreads so widely that it's clear that we will never eradicate it, and then we will shift towards towards mitigation, or until we can't find any more, and we can do that for at least three years. And that's sort of a, a, a standard measure for have you eradicated a thing if you cannot find it uh, any life stage for three years. Um, Wallace? Yeah, I, and I would say we are quite, um, we, we feel good that we'll be on the eradication path rather than the it's too widespread to control um, because it, it is such a small area that we're dealing with right now. So things look very positive for eradication. Yeah, and I can just say from the um, Agricultural Research Service standpoint, um, as Todd mentioned, one of the projects that I'm helping lead is the Ag 100 Pest Initiative, where we're sequencing the genomes of um, actually over 100 different pest species, and this being one of them, to better understand the pests that are affecting U.S. agriculture. So this goes into a much larger um, analysis of uh, providing these basic resources to scientists to, to use for their studies, to, to learn more about these species, how they relate to other species that are or are not pests, and to develop new and novel molecular uh, control methods uh, for, uh, for working or mitigating those issues that they're experiencing. Specifically for the Asian giant hornet, like I said, we've um, sequenced the genomes. Um, this is really going to aid in developing proper identification because, as others have mentioned, there's actually quite a lot of other hornet species from Asia where these are come from, and there are some difficulties based on um, visual similarities between them, as well as diversity within Asian giant hornets in terms of coloration patterns and some things that uh, molecular uh, tools to identify them more clearly will be really helpful with. Developing those molecular tools also means that in the case of having a nest that um, has been killed, uh, or sorry, a honeybee hive that has been killed, and there being a suspicion that Asian giant hornets were involved, perhaps because of a lot of dead, decapitated adult bees, right, that we can go in with a CSI approach and swab that and look and, and then sequence that material and, and uh, be a little bit more confident whether or not Asian giant hornets were involved with that honeybee um, kill. 
Um, so really, a lot of the work that we're doing is really the baseline, providing this infrastructure for a lot of other research and, and things that are working on. So um, once the, the samples are a little bit further processed by Marina and the other folks in her lab, we're going to sequence the genes, the, the active components in those um, various tissues to better understand um, and understand the landscape of this particular pest genome. Um, and that, again, is just going to help us better understand their, their fundamental biology. Um, so I, I'm really excited about this work. We're, um, we're really interested in developing these additional partnerships across Asia for sampling them and really better understanding this species in relationship to, to other wasps um, that, that are both here in the United States and abroad. Thanks, Anna. And thank you all uh, for panelists, as well as the interpreters for participating in this uh, very interesting webinar. Um, we didn't get to all the questions. We had a great number, I think over 50 questions, including some we got on social media. So all the questions will be answered and they'll be on the ARS website. There is uh, in the carousel right now, a link to the Asian Giant Hornet page. Uh, that's the page you link to, to get to the webinar. Uh, we'll also include a copy of the WSDA press release when it's out uh, and the questions as well. And the video for the dissection will also be on there as well as the YouTube channel. The agencies will also be uh, uh, ramping up social media with all the updates on the Asian Giant Hornet. So make sure you're on uh, WSDA, APHIS's, Cornell's, and ARS's Twitter and Facebook pages especially. Keep an eye out for updates. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, again, if you need more information, uh, you can contact, uh, you can reach out to ARS or on the ARS website.